My name is Rich Zeiger. I'm the pastor at Real Life Community Church in Three Oaks. And uh, I put my cell number up on there. I don't know if I'm supposed to do that or not. But in case uh, you have questions, things that I either wasn't clear about or you'd like some follow-up on, we don't get time for that. Uh, I just want to invite you. Feel free to hit me up anytime, call or text. I put my email up on there, but I'll never see it. So anyway, the text is quicker. It gets to me. Um, just a little bit about myself. Uh, grew up in the area, grew up in Three Oaks, uh, went to River Valley High School and graduated from there and our whole family has been there forever so uh, when I saw Gary Schaefer here that was pretty exciting and uh, got, got some fellows from down there. Uh, pretty much was never going to leave the farm, never going to leave Three Oaks, although as a young man, as a kid, like most of us, it's like I've got to get out there and live life, i got to get away from this small town. Spent the rest of my life trying to get back to that small town as soon as I left. Uh, joined the Air Force, got married, had kids, had more kids. So we, we ended up with five. I got eight grandchildren. Uh, my newest grandson, Martin, uh, my son-in-law, Stanton, is right here. He, he uh, gave me this gift of a, of a new grandson. So thank you, Stanton. Well done, sir. And, uh, <clears throat> so we're pretty excited about that. Uh, coached football and baseball and track, mostly football, uh, for quite a while. Uh, coached at Michigan Lutheran here for five years. Some of you are, are familiar with uh, ML. Uh, lost a lot of ball games, uh, a lot of different ways, and learned an awful lot in the process. So as we're working through this today, uh, I don't have anything particularly uh, earth-shattering. I'm going to presume that most of you already have a certain understanding of what the Bible says for men. We'll talk a little bit about it. I'm not going to try and build a case to win you over, to convince you that God has called you to be a particular kind of man, but I want to presume that you believe that God's word is the standard, and therefore uh, we'll kind of use that as our platform and go forward. So um, before we get into much of anything else, I just want to acknowledge the recent retirement of Tom Brady. Some of you are excited about that. Some of you are sad about that. None of you are unaware of that. So why? Somebody tell me, why does it matter that a 40-something-year-old dude retired from the NFL with more money than you and I could even probably count? Why does that matter? Who cares? Any thoughts? What makes Tom Brady special? If, through a football, is that I heard somebody say that? Yeah, his influence. His influence? All right. He's the only dude I know that could do an Uggs commercial and not lose man points for that. So, all right. Tom Brady was a leader of men, right? When, when you think of Tom Brady as a quarterback, he's got a lot of rings. He's got a lot of jewelry because he won a lot of championships. But at no point ever in his career was he the most athletically gifted player on the field, not even on his own team. When he was at Michigan, he could he was struggling to hold his starting job. No matter how well he did, they kept trying to take it away from him and give it to the young, talented kid, Drew Henson. And six of you know who Drew Henson is. All right? If you're not a Michigan fan, you probably don't know or care. He was with the Yankees, what, for a cup of coffee? Tom Brady was not the most talented guy. I don't even know if he's the smartest guy, although a lot of times we'll think that. He had the greatest arm. If you saw his combine picture, dude, should not have gone to the NFL. What Tom Brady did was whatever Tom Brady needed to do to be able to win. I'm going to suggest to you that that's part of what God calls us to as men, is to do whatever is needed. My definition of a hero, I looked up a bunch of definitions of heroes, and there's some really good ones and there's some really stupid ones. Mine is a hero is somebody who does what's needed because it's needed for others who need it. Whatever that is, whatever it is that you've got to step into the void when, when a firefighter runs to the crisis instead of away from it, that's heroic. When a dad who has no clue what he's doing because he was a dad before he was planning on it, learns how to change diapers, learns how to take care of his family. That's heroic. In, I'm not, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not great with PowerPoint stuff. I had my wife put this together for me because normally my brother-in-law and our tech team does that stuff. By the way, Dennis, you're going to have to cover bread tomorrow. So. 
So in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthian church, Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Do, let all that you do be done in love. Now there's some really important things here, and if I were preaching a sermon on this, we'd spend some time on it. I'm not. But there's one phrase that stands out to me as confusing. Act like men. In fact, the NIV and the newer edition of the NIV, they changed that because it's not politically correct to say act like men. So even though the ESV, which is a little more literal, I'm an NIV guy. NIV 84, by the way, that's the preferred translation of heaven. But, you know, with the, with the ESV, they're a little more literal. Act like men is not particularly clear if we don't know what that means, right? Every voice in America is going to tell us what kind of men we should be. Everybody's out there saying this is what you should be like, talking about toxic masculinity and all these different things. And there's something inside of us that craves a certain kind of manhood. We want to be a particular kind of man, and very often we don't feel like we can achieve it. And a lot of times, we don't really know what it is. We know there's a, a cry in us for it, but we really don't understand it. But God, who designed us, has a specific plan for what kind of men we must be. We want to talk about that a little bit today. So I'm going to suggest to you that as we're going through this, the, as, a, as a kind of a nutshell of what we're talking about, Men of God must lead our families and churches as a reflection of the reality of Christ. That's going to kind of be in the backdrop of everything that we're talking about. If you forget everything else, this is the thing I want you to walk <laughs> away with today. Is men of God must lead our families and churches as a reflection of the reality of Christ. So before we go any farther, let's take a minute and just pray. Father God, as we are gathered here as men we're all here for a variety of reasons. Some of us are not even entirely sure why we're here. We maybe we're dragged here by a friend. Some of us are here because we're hurting and struggling, and we don't quite know what we're going to do. Our families might be in trouble. Some of us are here having already blown it and wondering if it's too late. Some of us are here trying to get a foundation under us as we move forward in life. Whatever it is, Lord, we know that you've been behind it. None of us are here by accident. So we ask that you would open our eyes, our minds, our hearts, that we would hear not what we want to hear, not even what the speakers necessarily intend, but what your Holy Spirit has called us to glean from your word. Help us to build on wisdom. Speak beyond your servant's faltering tongue today, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. So, as we get started talking about men of God, you know, this idea that we must lead our families and churches as a reflection of the reality of Christ is a multifaceted thing. Uh, they've only allowed me a half an hour to, to do this session, and these guys up here who have gone to real life know, man, I can't even blow my nose in half an hour, so that's, we're, we'll do what we can do, and we'll, we'll get through it. But I want to, um, I know that a lot of us don't have Bibles with us, so I'm going to put some of these things on the screen for you. Uh, I want to draw your attention uh, to the theme verse that we've been looking at today, this, this press-on idea uh, from Philippians chapter 3. And the reason I want to bring this to you is because for some of us, you know, I know I might look super young with my white beard, but, you know, I've already raised my kids. One of my sons is here. I've got one daughter left at home. She's 15. She's going to be there for like 20 seconds more, and then she's gone. And it can be really overwhelming to feel like, man, I fall far short of the mark that God has for me, and I've blown it, and I don't know what I can do because I don't have a, a DeLorean needing to hit 88 miles per hour so I can travel back in time and fix this. I can't fix it. I can't undo the past. But... Paul tells the Philippian church in the midst of this very joyful letter while he is incarcerated 
And, the, and he's telling them about the character of Christ in chapter 2 and how all of our attitudes should be like this. And he brings them to a point of perspective, seeing the long view, as Chuck Swindoll would say, of things. But in chapter 3, he says, listen, not that I've already obtained all this, or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. I just realized I forgot to start my timer here. That's going to cost me. I hear you, Gabriel. I know it's usual. Here's the thing. Men get bashed a lot in our society. Amen? Amen. Right? Sometimes we can feel really beat up. And the pressure to be a man is already, from the jump, very, very heavy. That's by God's design. I'm going to tell you that right now. God intends for you to feel pressured and stressed and hand it over to him. In a few minutes, we're going to look at, at the creation account, just pieces of it in the first three chapters of Genesis. Because God created us to be a representation of him in the world, to be his, his vassal kings, his sub-regents. In other words, we're to be his managers, his stewards, as representatives of his kingdom rule. And that is always going to include pressure. I'm going to contend that one of the things that made Tom Brady who he was, and you're going to see this next week in the big game coming up with a couple of young Younger fellows, I don't know if Matt Stafford's young anymore, but he's younger than Tom Brady. Uh, so am I. No, I know. <laughs> but when the pressure gets heaviest, that's when the best comes out. God has called you in the pressure of manhood to shoulder the load, knowing full well that he did not, and he did this intentionally, did not make you sufficient to shoulder that load alone. A couple of things that we want to pay attention to. When we live out God's purpose for us as men, when we do this God's way, six things at least take place. One, we are fulfilled. We find our sense of fulfillment, our significance. Many men are searching for meaning, and we feel lost in a world that has kind of stripped away masculinity from us. If you're familiar with uh, Eldridge's uh, book, uh, Wild at Heart, that's kind of the whole premise of his ministry. It's God made us for a thing, and the world has taken the thing, and we've abdicated the thing, we've abandoned it, and we need to get back to the thing. When we live out God's purpose for us as men, we find ourselves fulfilled. We, we achieve that understanding of meaning and significance. Second, we see that women are blessed Believe it or not, contrary to what we've been told for the last 40 plus years, women want you to be men. Your women, your wives, your future wives, even, believe it or not, your ex-wives want you to be God's man. They may not know that's what they want, but when we do God's thing God's way and we fulfill this purpose... The women around us are blessed. They're not put upon. They're not demeaned or belittled. They're not bullied or coerced. They're blessed and they're led. Third, we see the children are shaped. Very often we've grown up with fathers who were distant or demanding or uh, they acquiesced to our every desire and spoiled us. And some of you had really good dads, and they still did all those things. None of us had perfect fathers. None of us are perfect fathers. None of us will be perfect fathers. But when we do life as men, the way God intends, whether you are a father or not, you provide something in family and society that shapes children in a way that honors God. Fourth, we see the church is edified. When Paul says, I don't allow a woman to, to teach or to have authority over a man, he is not saying in any way, I wish we had time to develop this, we don't. He's not saying that women are not 
equipped or sufficient or good enough or smart enough. He's not saying that they are less in value. He's saying there is a specific role in the church that God has designed to portray a specific relationship, specifically God's relationship to his people. And when men and women in the church take the role that God has assigned, rather than deciding, I get to make this call, the church is edified, it's built up, and it becomes what God intended. Fifth, the world is impacted. The world around us, not talking about you're going to be globally famous and, and everybody's going to be changed, but your world, the unbelieving world around you, outside of your church, outside of your family, is going to be impacted by your presence as a man. And lastly, and most importantly of all, God is glorified. That's the purpose for which we were designed. Now, as we work through this, true masculinity is rooted in creation. It's led by the Spirit and reflects the reality of Christ. And if you have a Bible, you can turn. In fact, I'm going to grab one because I left mine at home when I came. Uh, I don't know if there are any there. I'm not going to pass them out for the sake of time. But in Genesis chapter 1, wow, that print is super small. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, it gets smaller every year, amen? Uh, we see this very well-known beginning. In the beginning, what? God. Yeah, God created the heavens and the earth. So everything is created by God. And ultimately, we see this in uh, Revelation 4. We see it in Colossians 1, that everything is created by and for God, for his glory, for his purpose. He didn't need to create anything. He did so because he chose to. End of story. Why did he choose to? He doesn't tell us. It's his sovereign grace, his personal choice to reveal himself in relationship to creation. And he goes through in chapter 1, um, God said, let there be light. Jump ahead. There was light, right? And it was good. And, and God creates the, this expanse between the, the waters. He separates the water from water, and it was good. He goes through all these different phases of creation, or days of creation. And then we get to the latter part of it. And we read in this, this it should be verse 26, but I cannot read that number, so I'm going to assume it's verse 26. <laughs> Thank you, Brownie. My boy got me right here. All right. It, it, indeed, it is 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Right? So there's, a, there's an, an inbred, built into, designed into creation, what we call dominion in the King James. Right? This, this idea that we are God's representative rule in his creation. So God created mankind, verse 27, in his own image. It's the only part of creation in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Wait a minute now, he's, he's expanding this. Male and female, he created them. God created you male on purpose. It's not an accident. It's not something I get to decide if I'm going to identify one way or another. God made you the way he made you on purpose by his design. Jumping ahead to chapter 2, he gives us a little bit of a breakup. We see Adam and Eve created, starting in verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. And the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So having made everything good, humankind very good, he gives us the details of how this works out. Not the scientific details, but the relational details. He's looking for a helper that fits the man. Now, don't misunderstand, he's got all kinds of animals there that could be very helpful. He can train a monkey to do what he wants him to do. He can put his stuff on a donkey and have him carry it. Animals are helpful, but they're not peer helpers. They're not of the same kind. So he creates the woman. And it's interesting, he could have created the woman from the dust just as he did Adam and everything else, but woman alone was created from something else. For Adam, no suitable helper was found. Chapter 2, verse 21, So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones 
and flesh of my flesh. She should be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now, here's the thing. Adam was given the task as God's representative rule, his, his sub-regent, his vassal king. Adam was given the task, the responsibility of naming all of the animals. So as he sees them and sees what, what makes them who they are, he gives them a name. Not Joe or Fred, but what kind of a name? What, what is this animal? When woman is made, Adam is given the same responsibility and privilege. He defines her. He sees what she is, what makes her uniquely her. She is taken from man. There is an endemic part of, of manhood that involves responsibility and ruling on God's behalf. True masculinity, true masculinity does this God's way. It's built in. It's led by God, by his Holy Spirit, and reflects the reality of Christ. We hear a lot about toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity is corrupted by sin. It's driven by the flesh and distorts God's image. In the next chapter of Genesis, we see sin enter the picture. And it's interesting, you all remember who, who took the, uh, the fruit and was having the conversation with the snake, right? Which one was it, Adam or Eve? Eve. 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 And yet, throughout the scripture, the responsibility for sin falls on Adam. God doesn't say, Eve fell, therefore all of humankind fell. So Christ is the counter to that. But when we see in Romans, we see that in Adam all fell. Adam holds that role, that responsibility. When sin entered, it corrupted our nature as people. And it corrupted our nature as men. When we see what people call toxic masculinity, it's when we are doing our thing our way instead of God's thing God's way. This is when our appetites, our urges, our pride, our selfishness drive our masculinity. And all of the different things that we see, the, everything from sexual, sexual assault to domineering personalities, all of these things that are considered toxic come not from the innate design of manhood, but the corruption by sin when we let our flesh drive. We are given this role to represent God and the earth. In 2 Corinthians 5, we're told that we are, God, we are Christ's ambassadors. Right? We are to represent God, to represent Christ on the earth. He's making his appeal through us. In the same way, in our manhood, from the point of creation, we are designed to give an image of God, to bear, to carry the image of God, among his creation. As we are here amidst this living of life, people see God in us before they ever read the Bible. This isn't just true for Christians. It's true for all of us. Because we're all called to the same purpose. Whether you, are, whether you have received Christ and you're in that relationship with him or not, your purpose is still the same to glorify God, as the Westminster Confession would say, to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's true for every person, but we're separated from that purpose by sin. I don't want to get off track too far here and start, start getting an evangelism going. God designed male and female to be distinct, interdependent, and equal. You probably heard a hundred times the, the, the uh, trope that Woman was created from the rib, from the man's side, not from his head that she might be over him, or not from his feet that she might be beneath him, but from his side so that she could walk alongside him as equal. That's cute. It's not biblical, but it's not entirely wrong either. God took her from man to be a helper, not to be a tool, and not to be a ruler over him, to be a helper, to be a peer helper and we are distinct. Men and women are not the same. Amen? And I will say, viva la difference. I'm very happy that my wife is very much a woman. And I'm not. 
But we are also designed to be interdependent. It takes both of us, both male and female, to bring out the full representation of God in creation by his design. We are distinct and interdependent. We are also equal. And this is particularly true for those of us who know Christ. Christ redeemed sexuality. And I don't mean the reproductive aspect of it, but our gendered living as God created us male and female. In Christ, this is redeemed. Not that it has changed, but we have changed. As his grace has changed us, we now recognize what was true from Eden on. In Christ, there's no male or female. We have different roles. We're created with the same worth. Right? If you're a sports fan, if you love football, then you'll understand what I'm saying. If you don't, then I'll pray for your soul. But as we are talking about sports, who's the most important player? I'll change, since Gary's here, I'll change to basketball. Who's the most important player on the court in a basketball team? It, it depends on what's needed, right? If you need to take a shot, your shooter's most important. If you need to make a pass, your passing is most important. The, the position isn't the point. One's not more important. Each one has a different role. And it breaks down when your point guard decides he doesn't want to distribute the ball anymore. When your post player decides everything needs to run through him. If that's not the design, things go haywire. When we think that, when we think that, that one position is more important than another, then we lose it. Same is true with male and female. Now, all people exist to reflect God's glory and intimacy with him. I, I, I want us to understand this because this is the heart of the gospel. All of us exist to reflect God's glory in an intimate relationship with him, but sin separates us from that relationship. Praise God, in Jesus Christ, we have a way to restore that. Because by God's grace, he took our sin to the cross, offering us new life in himself by uniting with him. This is true for everyone, period. <clears throat> those who belong to the Lord, those who have entered into that relationship, now because you are aligned with him, we must reflect the reality of Christ through our relationships. Truth and love work together for the Christian. Now for men, God calls men to illustrate the authority and character of Christ through loving leadership. And I'm at the end of my time, but I want to draw your attention to the best picture I know of that in Ephesians 5. It's about marriage, but it's not really just about marriage. This comes in, in uh, a book that is really about who we are, our identity in Christ. And the second half of the book is, what does it look like to walk that out? Ephesians 5.21 gives a command to all of us to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. But here's what we see in Ephesians 5 following that. As he says, this is what it looks like. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. That doesn't mean she submits to everybody. You're not married. This is not the call. But wives, submit to your husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And to this, all the men say, Amen. But then he gets to the bigger paragraph. And the bigger challenge, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. Oh, it's great, I love my wife. No, 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 no. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. This requires sacrificial love, not an affection, but a choice to take responsibility. He who loves his wife loves himself. I'm going to jump ahead for the sake of time. Okay, this, this idea here is, is the picture of Christ and the church. And so the difference here between man and woman is not in value, but in role. We are called together, marriage is the, the, the ultimate picture of this, but we are called to specifically 
illustrate Christ and his church. A biblical manhood is responsibility. We take the role of Christ, whether we are married, pre-married, post-married, whatever our situation is, it's not tied to that. The sense of responsibility that we draw from this to do good for and to bring holiness to the women and children and world around us is the primary distinction between our roles. When we fail to do our job, the whole team suffers. Is the quarterback more important than the guy blocking for the quarterback? <laughs> Depends on if he's getting hit. Right? We've seen that just recently. If I don't do my job, somebody else has to step up. Why did radical feminism take over our society? Because men failed to be biblically masculine. When we failed to accept our responsibility in leading our families, our churches in love, we left a void, a vacuum that needed to be filled. And women had to step up. They took our spot because we left that vacuum. Now I want to tell you, if you are the leader, you don't have to tell anybody that you're the leader, right? Tom Brady is out there banging his chest saying, hey, I'm the quarterback. Respect me. He's doing the job. And when you do the job, the respect comes. If you're going to bang your chest to tell everybody you're the leader, guess what you're not? You're not the leader. When we love our wives, when we lead our families out of a sacrificial love, they're blessed. Our children want to follow our example because we look like Christ. When we fail to do our job, the whole team suffers. Let me wrap this up with some, some thoughts. Christ-like leadership from us requires at least these ten things. A passion for God's word. You might think, oh, I'm not a Bible scholar. God didn't call you to be a Bible scholar. There's nothing in the scriptures that says this is a Bible scholar. He called you to be a Bible student. A scholar is a student who stuck with it. Get a passion for God's word, cling to God's word, and put in the work to learn God's word. It requires godly wisdom. James tells us in his letter, if any of you lack wisdom, if you're not sure what to do, Ask God. He gives generously without finding fault. Wisdom doesn't mean that you're the smartest guy. You don't have to handle all the specific jobs yourself. In my family, my wife takes care of the money. Praise God. We're all happy for that. She spent a lot of time in banking. She's just better at it. So I don't do it. But guess who's responsible? I am. We have different roles. We do different things. It's not about having the best ability. The best coach isn't always the smartest guy. He's the guy that's smart enough to know that he's not the smartest guy, so I'm going to be humble enough to find people who can take me where I want to go. Christ-like leadership requires embracing benevolent responsibility. In other words, I take ownership of this responsibility not for my glory, but for your good. I want to do what's best for my wife, for my family, for my community, for my church. It's not about position. It's about seeking what is best for others. Christ-like leadership embraces benevolent responsibility. It also requires stability despite circumstances. This is one of the primary hallmarks of maturity. When we freak out, that is a sign of immaturity, of a short view. We need to take a long view, as we heard in Larry Osborne's session. We need to live like we know how the outcome is going to turn out. We know who wins. So we live under God's dominion, reflecting God's dominion, knowing that ultimately he wins. We don't have to freak out under any circumstances. It involves perseverance under trial. You will be tested. Things will go wrong. Stuff gets hot. It always does. Manhood stays. That's what we do. It involves sacrificial love, laying down myself. Now, we might think, yeah, I'd take a bullet for my, for my wife, for my children. That's not really laying. That's easy, right? Die, the dying part is easy. It's the living part that's hard. I'd take a bullet for my wife, but I'm not giving up the remote to the TV, right? i got to lay myself down, sacrificial love is a requirement for Christ-like leadership. 
It requires strength with humility. It doesn't mean that you have to be the biggest, the baddest, the toughest, the most macho. What it does mean is you have to know where you stand and stand, period. And when you stand for what you know to be right and true, to recognize that it's not about you. We stand with humility under, under the rule of God. Courageous righteousness means that we fight for justice. We do what is right no matter what the cost. We seek to do what God has called us to no matter what. And increasing holiness. Some of you are thinking, well, I'm, the holiness thing, I'm, I'm lacking that already. It's not about perfection. You're not going to achieve that in this life. We follow Christ not perfectly, but increasingly. And so as we are set apart for him then we are demonstrating this increasing holiness that will lead our families and consistent integrity. It means there's no gaps here. It's not a matter of I, I don't stumble. We do stumble. But I'm not going to stay there. I'm not going to quit on it. There aren't going to be gaps in my character. Christ-like leadership requires this. Men of God must lead our families and churches as a reflection of the reality of Christ. It's not about being the, having the most ability or being the smartest. It's not about your personality type. You don't have to be the, the big alpha male type of person. None of these requirements we just talked about require any of those personality traits. They don't require a particular training other than developing a passion for God's word. What they require is absolute submission to the Lord and an absolute love for his people specifically those he's put in our circle of influence you're going to hear Pastor Marvin talk more specifically about that uh, in his keynote and what it means to be a liberating leader as men so for now let me leave you with that thought men of God must lead our families and churches as a reflection of the reality of Christ when we do what we are called to do they will see and glorify our God let's pray Father thank you for bringing us together today Open our eyes as we go through this. Help us to worship together. Help us to live in a way today that will carry out into the rest of our lives, into our daily when we go back home. So this isn't just a one-off moment on this Saturday. We pray all this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.